of noontide on a beautiful Honolulu winter day. This is Howard Wig, Think Tech Hawaii, Code Green. And are we going to be green today? We're going to be as green as the beautiful trees outside and as cool as the beautiful trees outside. And if we have anything to do with it, we will be greener and cooler in the near future. Thanks to Dan Donnell, our esteemed guest for the day. Dan is the president of Trees for Honolulu. But before I get to Dan, I have to mention his heritage a little bit. Uh, in the, it was the upper Pleistocene, I believe, when I was a grad student at UH. Just came back from world travels, and I was very concerned about the environment. Then I was casting about on the UH Manoa campus for fellow travelers who way, way, way back then were pioneers in environmentalism. And I met a, a the head of the urban and regional planning department. He had uh, founded it, and that was Tom Donnell. And he and I became uh, good, good buddies, and he did a good job of uh, being reproductive, and he and I assume his wife spawned Dan Donnell, who is our esteemed guest today. Welcome, Dan, so much. Good chip chip off the old block here. Well, well, Howard, I'm not sure I've ever had an introduction like that before, but it's uh, wonderful to be here. And yes, I'm, uh, I'll proudly take my heritage. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Warren Buffett calls the em, calls it the embryonic lottery when you're born into very fortunate circumstances. So all of us Honolulu residents, especially those of us who were blessed to live in cooler areas, we both turn out to be Manoa residents, we notice the temperature difference between where we are in Manoa and when we get down to the flatlands. And it's not just greater access to the trade winds, it's not just the greenery, or it is the greenery. And when we get into the urban areas, we experience the urban heat island effect. And I have done measurements contrasting my home with the, the flatlands, the city area, and it's eight degrees. If it's 88 in the city, it's about 80 at my place. And all these winter mornings, when I leave, I leave very early, but I actually have to turn the heat on because the valley is so blessedly cool. So, Dan, take it away. Tell us, is Honolulu as cool now as it was 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago? Or have things changed? Well, Howard, no surprise to you or, or your viewers. Uh, things have changed. They're continuing to change. And it's really um, a serious uh, situation because people don't realize it, but heat is the number one weather-related killer in the United States. So I don't know if you want to be number one in this category. I mean, it beats hurricanes, earthquakes, tsunami, any type of weather-related uh, catastrophe and it's heat and, and you may even recall last summer um, the Pacific Northwest record heats in Seattle, Portland, uh, British Columbia and it's it's um, a silent insidious killer and uh, Honolulu is suffering in, in the same way and we have a couple maps here we can uh, uh, show if you want to uh, bring up uh, the first slide this um, is a transect of, of the urban area of Honolulu. This is three to four in the afternoon. And uh, volunteers went out, they measured the heat and the red areas are hotter. Uh, the green areas or, or blue in this case are measured cooler. And then the green areas um, uh, are the mountains and, and elsewhere. And if you go to the next slide, this is after the sun has set. This is 7 to 8 p.m. at night. And you can still see those red areas around downtown Honolulu, around Kaka'ako, uh, the edges of Pearl Harbor. And what's happening, Howard, is the uh, 
buildings, the built environment is retaining the heat. And what it doesn't have are those, you, you see the fingers in Manoa, Palolo, Nuuanu, the valleys are blue. They're losing heat because they're surrounding areas uh, and they have greater uh, tree canopy. So, um, you know, it's, it's a big uh, problem and it's gonna, uh, it's worse today than it was in the past. And it really is a um, creeping uh, disaster. And I'm so happy to be here and talk with you who, you know, you're a great expert in, uh, you know, solutions to, to heat. So uh, maybe we'll get into that a little bit. Yeah, so, somehow the phrase urban heat island effect comes to mind here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the um, heat islands are really what they sound like. They just, they retain the heat uh, well past um, uh, the evening hours. And it's a big problem because the earth uh, needs to cool. Uh, and the next morning, in order to have a cooler morning, it needs to cool down overnight. And um, it, this is not a problem unique to Hawaii. It, you see this uh, around the world. The, the issue, though, is it's uh, getting worse. And what's going to be happening are the health outcomes. Um, you know, uh, people who are older uh, and youth, uh, particularly babies, infants, toddlers, they have a hard time regulating heat. And it, it's going to be, uh, or it already is, I really should say, a, a problem. And it's a problem where uh, there's different approaches. Um, and love to talk more with you about the green uh, approach, since that's sure. code green but, today. But just precisely, just, just maybe to simplify an example of urban heat island effect. If you are barefoot on asphalt, black asphalt, in the middle of a sunny day, the asphalt is so hot, you cannot, your feet cannot stand it. But if you were to remain on that asphalt and a cloud, great big cloud came over and obliterated the sun for a long time, you could stand there for a long time and that asphalt would still be hot. It wouldn't just immediately give, give you a relief because it, there's the concept of absorptivity. The radiant heat it absorbs into that black rough asphalt and it stays there and it emits back to the atmosphere just very, very slowly. This is something I'm personally involved in. I sit on the board of the Cool Roof Rating Council, and we just formed the Cool Wall Rating Council. And the idea there is to get into building codes, reflective roofs and reflective walls. And then we have a subset of the urban heat island effect. Yeah, so you know, just a little aside there. You no, know, I, I, I appreciate it. You know, you're an expert on, on green roofs and building codes. And, the, and these are all, uh, I guess that's, that's, that may be my main message today. There's not one single solution. There needs to be multiple uh, approaches. Uh, it's not one size fits all, but it's, we need everything here. We need the, the building codes to change. We need uh, green roofs. And uh, in particular, my organization, Trees for Honolulu's Future, we believe we need more trees uh, mm -hmm. because trees bring tremendous benefits, um, not just for the heat island uh, uh, to mitigate uh, the heat island effect, but you know, look at the, the trees. They, they sequester carbon, they make oxygen, they uh, provide the shade that you were just uh, uh, talking about. They um, capture stormwater uh, runoff. They, they're, they work so hard for us. And, you know, for, for viewers, you know, just think uh, right here in Honolulu, like compare Kapiolani Boulevard, the street between mm -hmm. downtown Honolulu and Ala Moana Center, where you've got the monkey pod canopy over the street and compare that to South King Street, same areas, you know, downtown to University Avenue. And, and there are very few trees. Where do you want to be? which has higher real estate values? Where, where is commerce and life more vibrant? And I would uh, uh, premise that it's Kapiolani Boulevard, not South mm -hmm. King Street. 
Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the value of uh, real estate. Uh, I had the good fortune many years ago to be staying with a friend in El Paso, Texas, and it was winter, and uh, she had a view, a valley view of a lot of El Paso and an, a view of Juarez, Mexico, across the Rio Grande, and El Paso, you, it was just green, 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 these red tile roofs, and then more green, more green, more trees, more trees. And then El Paso was just this shroud of blacks and browns. It was really inhospitable looking in contrast to El Paso with all the trees. And we're a, we as a nation are a heck of a lot richer than Mexico, and it was just reflected, among other things, pun intended, reflected in the amount of trees there. Well, well, and you know, you, you talk about um, the amount of trees and and really the 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 wealth and the privilege that that we have. Um, I, you know, I'm here to say we got some bad news. If you want to bring up the next slide, uh, Honolulu, we're actually losing urban forest. Uh, and this map here, uh, the, the dark maroon color, five to seven percent loss in uh, two periods of time. This was 2010 and then in, again in 2013 using LIDAR data. Uh, you can see the Kalihi Pearl Harbor area and, and unfortunately the Kaimuki uh, Manoa Palolo area as well, losing the most trees, but every single part of the island, the urban uh, part of the island lost uh, tree canopy. And, and that's a big uh, problem and pretty excited because our organization, we're working with the city and we get, we'll uh, get some updated data and we can really see have we made a difference in the last few years. Um, but how do we stack up to other US cities? If we go to the next slide, uh, we'll see Honolulu is on the bottom third. Uh, in terms of urban tree canopy. And this is kind of sad. I mean, we, we are a tropical environment, year round growing season. Um, and, you know, our canopy is about 22, 23%. Um, and the city's stated policy is to get to 35%. And just to give you a sense of the context there, 35% is where Washington, D.C. is uh, today. And so, Washington, D.C might not be pleasant politically, but it's pleasant in terms of the environment and, and things uh, are around the, the, the city. And Honolulu, we, we need to get there. And people often ask me, well, why, Dan? Why, you know, have we, you know, cut down, a, uh, you know, a large swaths of urban uh, tree canopy? And, and the, the fact is, it's not that, it's, you lose a tree here, you lose a tree there. It's the cumulative effect that has caused uh, us to be in this situation where we are today. Yeah, uh, even in the back of Manoa where I live, uh, the house in back of me was very tree enshrouded and a new person moved in and she decided to chop down some beautiful over you know, large canopy trees and lo and behold, shortly after that, an AC system appeared. AC in the back of Manoa Valley, you can only, you only need that when you have exposed yourself to all the, the sun's radiant heat directly. You know, I, what a sad story to share, but it's a real story because people are, just taking their unilateral action and without really any regard to the community impact. And, um, and then the fact is you remove these canopy shade trees and install AC, which then further compounds uh, all the energy issues. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a real sad commentary. And, if uh, you want to call up another slide here, uh, we'll stick to the uh, Manoa area. You, you're familiar with this. This is the University mm -hmm. Avenue off-ramp, uh, looking in the Cocoa Head uh, direction from University Avenue. And uh, the upper shot was uh, July of 2019. See a couple trees there. 
Um, you know, things are good. It's the height of summer, but the grass is green. And 2019, by the way, was one of the hottest summers on record in Honolulu. And then the DOT removed the trees and um, you have the shot below the May 2020. Um, and you can see that there's uh, bare dirt. Uh, the grass is now dead. Um, and, you know, the reason the trees were removed was because homeless were living under those trees there. Now, that's unfortunate, but the removal of the trees didn't solve the homeless problem. It just moved that problem somewhere else in the Mo'ili'ili area. And um, this is the kind of example uh, that we're having time and time again uh, throughout Honolulu. And our organization, we, we advocate um, for trees and the public policy around trees. So, you know, State DOT removes those three large trees. Um, they, they were there for decades. Um, we don't want them to just replace three, you know, trees, skinny trees, tree for tree. We want them to replace a lot more trees because if we don't do that, we'll never uh, catch up. We'll never turn this ship around where you're seeing uh, removal of trees, and um, increasing uh, heat, increasing uh, the heat island effect. And um, yeah, whether it's, it's in neighborhoods where you, where you live, where you work, uh, where you transit, uh, uh, trees have this incredible, incredible value. And just, um, just removing them without a plan, without a replacement, without um, any thought is just a really uh, unfortunate thing. And somehow the word transpiration comes to mind, as does the phrase nature's air conditioners. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can probably talk to the science much better than, than me, uh, Howard. But uh, yeah, the, the trees actually um, uh, create really a, almost a misting system. So you can, you know, you go to... Um, uh, perhaps uh, the water park or Disneyland or something, and, and there's uh, misters there. Well, trees do that as, as part of uh, natural uh, air conditioning, and it creates um, a, a wonderful cooling effect that is, um, you know, something that is uh, truly remarkable. I, and I think uh, of, uh, Al Gore wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times uh, a couple of years back, and he's like, you know, the best invention for climate change, for sequestering carbon, for cooling, is something called the tree. You know, nature has invented this incredible air conditioning system. Um, so the proper placement of trees, uh, you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis your buildings and, and so forth, um, will, will make a demonstrable uh, impact, a very positive impact. Um, so yes, you are among the enlightened ones, I, I'll, I'll say. And in terms of transpiration, you have the water in the ground getting into the roots, traveling up the trunk, spreading to the branches, getting into the leaves, and then the leaves, the moisture in the leaves evaporates. And when you have evaporating water, you have a temperature reduction. Yeah, as, as I said, the, yeah, I'll just, you know, we, we may have to rename you Dr. Science because you've got the science down pat. Um, and, and that's the amazing thing. I was thinking about it before uh, the show today. You don't even need the empirical measurements. You can just go out there and experience it yourself. You know, where would you rather be uh, if you're uh, watching your you know, child uh, or grandchild soccer game? Watch where the parents and the grandparents sit. They're, they're under the trees. They're not out on the sidelines in the sweltering heat. Um, and, and people are, if you will, voting uh, with their uh, behavior with their with their feet, and um, that gives us uh, a lot of uh, hope. But we, you know, our organization, we want to educate uh, folks more about the value of trees. That um, you know, they, it it really shouldn't be a question of why plant a tree. It should be why not plant a tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just empirically, I 
had some time on a hot summer day. It was actually, I think, on Molokai. And I had a heat gun because I was going around buildings measuring uh, heat coming through the windows and so forth. And I, this is the middle of the day, very sunny, pretty hot. I measured the asphalt temperature in the direct radiant sun, 142 degrees, the asphalt, not very pleasant. Then I walked over to the same asphalt shaded by a tree, zoom, 102 degrees. Then I went right next door, shaded tree, grass, 89 degrees. Just incredible information stored right in that little informal experiment. Well, well you'd be excited uh, to, to learn. Um, we recently got a uh, Environmental Protection Agency grant uh, award to work with young people um, mm -hmm. in the Makalapa area of Oahu. And um, we are literally going to be working with uh, elementary, middle, and high school students to do exactly that measuring the heat in the parking lots, in their buildings, in the grassy fields, and then working with the students, bringing in outside experts and others to talk about uh, various ways to mitigate the heat and, and let the, the children, uh, student scientists, come up with solutions, solutions that work for their school, for their home. And we're real excited about that and really brings to, to the fore should you know, the EPA or other regulators regulate heat. You know, that is a, a question, you know, we, we regulate other pollutants, uh, but we don't really have regulations uh, around heat that perhaps, uh, perhaps we need uh, in order to uh, not just further the conversation, but to further the action uh, necessary. And just in terms of policy, when a new neighborhood opens up, I'm thinking single family residence or, or townhouses, is there a requirement that X number of trees spaced X feet apart be part of that uh, new, new development? Yes, there is. Um, and the city uh, ordinances uh, require it. They require a certain number of trees and parking lots and so forth. Uh, but we do have a problem because what tends to happen is the trees are the last things addressed. So they've laid the sewer pipes, they've, they've, uh, they've got electro, uh, electrical conduits and you know, water lines and so forth. Um, and at the very end of the discussion becomes the trees. And, and you just can't plop a tree anywhere. They need space and they need space underground um, and they need uncompacted soil. So, you know, part of where, where we're working, and in fact, I'll be uh, uh, one of our uh, certified arborists and I are, are speaking with engineers tomorrow in a conference talking to them about the value of putting the trees up front in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Don't wait till the end when you have everything else laid out and then you're kind of scratching your head going, uh, where do we put these required uh, trees? Um, it's, it's really uh, an unfortunate way to, to be looking at it. Um, and then moreover, um, the, the current ordinances are really, they talk about a tree and the caliper, the diameter of, of the tree. Um, and they're not terribly worried about the canopy. And we're worried about the canopy. We want to see large shade trees, um, the, the type that your neighbor uh, sadly removed, because we believe that's going to make the biggest impact. So, you know, we, we call them the lollipop trees, you know, these trees that are just small, have a nice little crown and that's it. Uh, those trees are, they're okay, but they're not going to create the yeah. kind of city that we need in the future. Yeah, uh, somehow the monkey pot comes to mind there. That's one of the greatest canopy spreaders around. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, absolutely. And, and earlier, uh, you know, mentioning uh, Kapiolani Boulevard and, and, you know, those monkey pods and, and, and other trees provide just a lot of, of value. And that value is 
in that canopy. Um, and yeah, so got a lot more uh, policy work to be done, that's for yeah. sure. Have there been any uh, studies done about neighborhood to neighborhood tree canopy percentage, one neighborhood to the next, and then the value, the home value in, in, that, in those neighborhoods? Yeah, uh, we actually um, have, it, have access to data that can look neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, we haven't cross-tabbed that with the values of, of uh, homes in that uh, neighborhood. Um, but you would think that there would be a correlation. Uh, the Kaimuki area where we're, we have a project um, is under-treed uh, in comparison to some of the surrounding um, uh, parts of urban Honolulu. Um, and part of our theory there is um, the, the change that's occurred. You know, talk with um, old timers and they'll say, oh, yeah, they, they used to have the mango and the lychee tree in the backyard. Mm -hmm. Those got removed. Uh, the, the monster homes have come in. People are building, you know, to the full um, uh, zoning lot. And these things add up. So uh, absolutely, um, uh, we can compare it. We just haven't done that. There, there are comparisons done um, to other indicators, uh, income levels, uh, to uh, health outcomes, and so forth. And no surprise, um, you'll get... Um, better health outcomes with better canopy, you have higher personal wealth in areas with more trees. Uh, New York Times, and it's actually on our website, a link to an article uh, that uh, actually uh, looked at this uh, very extensively. Beautiful. On that very, very, very cheery note, then <laughs> now we must bid fond farewell, but I know that you are bringing this group of kids up and look forward in um, six months, 12 months, whatever, to having you back. And I want some kids participating oh. in the program to give, give them that experience. I, I promise you the kids are, are much, much cuter than you and I. And I, <laughs> I would, uh, my, my thought is they'll probably be uh, much smarter than, than uh, mm -hmm. you and I. Mm -hmm. So uh, they are the future. I mean, I don't want to sound trite, but um, the work being done now is not only for today. It is really for tomorrow. Absolutely. And that's what makes it so critical. Absolutely. I would do a couple of quotes, but we are out of time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dan Vanell. And I promise we will be back for Good. a cooler future. Thank you, Howard. And just remember, Honolulu is hot, but trees are cool. Cool. Okay. On farewell to all, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. See you next time.